we're continuing our neurological theme tonight and our next guest is Dr. Richard Gordon. Dr. Gordon leads the Translational Neuroscience Laboratory at the University of Queensland's Faculty of Medicine. His research career has focused on understanding the crucial role of the innate immune system in driving chronic inflammation in progression of Parkinson's disease. His research group is developing disease-modifying treatments for Parkinson's disease using new and repurposed therapeutic drugs. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you all for coming to this talk and for having me here to discuss our research on Parkinson's. Uh, and I lead the Translational Neuroscience and Drug Repurposing Group at the UQ Centre for Clinical Research. I'm a fairly new group leader. I just made the transition from being a postdoctoral fellow to be, being a group leader a couple of years ago. And a large part of my work at that, through this transition was supported by Wesley Medical Research. As you'll probably see over the next few slides of my talk, we've got about three different projects funded by Wesley Medical Research, uh, two of which are in the, actually all of which are in the clinical trial space and with clinical research with patients. and. Wesley has been great to support some of our work that's come out of the, the discoveries we've made in our animal studies funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation and helped us transition that to a point where we can get clinical trial funding for it. So as most of you might be aware, there's a huge impact, economic impact of Parkinson's here in Australia. Uh, there's one in 300 people have Parkinson's at the moment, there's currently no treatments for Parkinson's and no biomarkers for early detection. So there's no real way to slow the disease. You can give people uh, things like levodopa, dopamine replacement, but that really manages the symptoms. It doesn't do anything to prevent the year-on-year -year progression. <coughs> so every year there's about a 7% decline in the disease that you can measure using defined motor scores. So most people tend to think of Parkinson's as a motor dysfunction, a motor disease. So you have the typical symptoms such as uh, the rigidity, the tremor, and the. it's essentially similar to what James Parkinson described in his first essay back about 200 years now in called the shaking palsy. So, but what people don't realize often with the disease is the motor symptoms tend to start a few at the time of diagnosis here is when people have motor dysfunction, but you really have all of these non-motor symptoms that tend to start uh, several years, decades actually before the motor symptoms. So really uh, things like sleep, constipation are actually, if you talk to patients, more debilitating than the motor symptoms. And in fact, when you, they start to go on these dopamine replacement therapies, their non-motor symptoms tend to get worse. So this need for, there's a really pressing need for developing these therapies that can slow disease progression, which is where most of the focus of the field is at the moment. And that's what our research focuses here at UQ. So Parkinson's is basically caused by a loss of dopamine. So you see there on the top slide, the uh, top section there, the Parkinson's, that's a, a scan, a brain scan of a patient with Parkinson's. And you'd see here a healthy control. They have a lot more dopamine in their brains and it's caused by a loss of these dopamine producing neurons, which you can see in the black there, where, which is lost progressively in people with Parkinson's. So the healthy controls have a lot of these dopamine producing control neurons as they age, but in people with Parkinson's, these neurons tend to die and subsequently the dopamine that they make in, in these regions of the brain is also lost. So what's interesting that's emerged over the last probably 10 years in Parkinson's is that there's a lot of inflammation that's associated with Parkinson's. If you, This is a brain scan for the immune cells in the brain, which is used as a proxy marker for inflammation in the brain. So what you could see is as in healthy people in the bottom there, there is a relatively little or no inflammation or immune activation present in the brain. But in a, as Parkinson's 
occurs and this is actually in a living patient at the early stages of Parkinson's and not at the late stages, you can see that there is a lot of immune activation there in, in the person with Parkinson's. So that is concomitant with their loss of dopamine producing neurons. So it was a link that was known for a long time and there was a lot of controversy whether it was actually causative, whether the inflammation is just a consequence of the neurons dying or whether that could be actually contributing to the disease. But that has shifted over the last 10 to 15 years where there's been a lot of evidence in, in animal models and also with emerging now from clinical studies where they found this inflammation could actually be, could be detrimental to the disease process and cause the disease to progress with time. So that's what's led to this what we call the cycle of neurotoxicity, so a chronic, chronic inflammation cycle. You have these immune cells called the microglia that are activated, and then you've got these neurons that are progressively dying. So the dying neurons tend to activate the immune cells, and then there is a self-perpetuating cycle where the inflammation triggered by the immune cells is, leads to the loss of the neurons, and then that in turn tends to activate more, more inflammation in the brain. So what we think is inflammation is a result of this activation of immune cells in the brain and both systemically in the blood as well, you could measure that as you'd see. Normal inflammation is, ben normally inflammation is beneficial. So in the context of say an infection, a bacterial viral infection, the, the body's immune system is there to pre prevent any continuous infection or prevent the infection from getting worse and clear the invading pathogens. But what we see in the case of Parkinson's and also many other neurodegenerative diseases is this, in, this inflammation doesn't just persist. It, it doesn't go away. It keeps getting, in fact, it increases with as the disease progresses. So this uncontrolled inflammation is really the key to what's emerging in as a theme in most neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, where you have uncontrolled inflammation that is thought to drive this progressive loss of these neurons and the loss of the dopamine producing neurons in the case of Parkinson's. So what's really emerged in the last few years of, uh, of research is we've actually uncovered, not us as such, but the field has uncovered what could be the trigger for this inflammation. and. All of the evidence or the majority of the evidence tends to point to these what we call disease specific protein aggregates. So in Parkinson's you have what's called the Lewy bodies which you can see on the top there and they accumulate and spread in a very defined fashion in the brain as you could tell from the from the figure here. So what we what we're seeying is that these protein aggregates accumulate their reason for which is still un unclear you can find them at autopsy in pretty much every Parkinson's patient that you have these Lewy bodies uh, to a different extent depending on how severe their disease is. And what you, what you can see is here when we have the microglia or the immune cells in the brain reacting to these protein aggregates. So the protein aggregates, we could stain them in a brain section. You could see that with pink here. And the immune cells, so the microglia in this case, are the cells that you see here in brown. And they are, you could see them almost attacking these, immune, these protein aggregates. And that's what we think if we can stop this process, that we could definitely at least have a good shot at halting the disease progression. And one of the reasons we like to target or we believe inflammation is a really good therapeutic target is if you talk to a person with Parkinson's or a group of people with Parkinson's, they'd all tell you that they have varying amounts of symptoms and everyone's Parkinson's is actually different. So, but what's emerging from the evidence and the research literature is that irrespective of what could be causing Parkinson's, which actually we believe is different in every individual, irrespective of what the trigger or the cause of Parkinson's is, you always in almost every case see that they have this underlying inflammation in the brain, which is why we think it's a common underlying pathophysiological mediator that we can target and then that gives us uh, the scope to treat or slow or halt this disease progression in Parkinson's irrespective of what the cause is. So 
what we've the recent groundbreaking discovery we've made in our group and uh, the work we've done more broadly at UQ between different teams is that this persistent inflammation in the brain is triggered by what's called the inflammasome pathway. So the inflammasome pathway is a protein complex. It's present in all immune cells, both in the blood and in the brain. And it is triggered by bacterial infections. It is triggered by things like gout, where, where you have urate crystals that accumulate. It, it basically it prevents, it triggers the immune response and it's central to the inflammatory pathways in in the immune system. So the inflammasome pathway is made up of a complex of different proteins, as you can tell there. It's the NLRP3 inflammasome is the one that we found to be responsible for triggering or attacking these protein aggregates in the immune cells that are found in the brain. So we found when we looked in people with Parkinson's, there was extensive activation of this pathway. So this is a postmortem Parkinson's disease brain. And we, we basically stained for the inflammasomes, the NLRP3 complex in red, and the immune cells were actually in green. But what we found was there was so much inflammasome activation, it almost drowned out the stain that we used for the immune cells. So it kind of told us there was extensive inflammasome in, in activation in pretty much every Parkinson's disease brain we looked at. And we went on to do probably, I want to say about three, to four years of work on this, and it was published in a landmark paper last year in Science Translational Medicine. So it's one of the uh, one of the biggest journals in our field of translational research. And we use this drug called MCC 950 that was developed by the Institute of Molecular Bioscience (IMB) at UQ in Professor Matt Cooper's lab. So what we found was when we blocked this inflammasome pathway in the brain of people with Parkinson's, we could essentially elicit really strong neuroprotection. So this was all over the news. So this was published about October, November last year, and it was in the news cycle by a long, for a long time. This was entirely based off our work in postmortem patient brains and also in our mouse studies where we tested this drug. What it was hailed as real progress in Parkinson's because this drug was one of the first ones to block the disease progressing in an animal model where you have these protein aggregates present. So that's been traditionally really difficult to attain. We've got neuroprotection that we demonstrated in multiple animals of Parkinson's disease. And that actually led to more recently, in a, it led to a, a whole, a lot of investment from pharmaceutical companies, Big Pharma, targeting this inflammasome pathway, which actually was summarized and our work was highlighted as part of this work in Nature Biotechnology just a couple of months ago. So the link to the synuclein and the Lewy body aggregates is what triggered a lot of investment now from pharma. And this drug, the MCC950, was commercialized through the University of Queensland. And a company called Inflizome was formed. And they've just raised close to 80 million to take this drug to its clinical trials, which should be happening early next year. So our focus since then, and in the work that was funded by Wesley Medical Research and subsequently by the state government, is where we've focused on repurposed drugs which has been where my research and my group, were, that's where our focus has shifted to because, and the reason we do repurposing is because it can take up to five to 10 years to take a new drug from discovery in the lab all the way towards clinical trials. So 95% of drugs can fail in that process, so which I found quite difficult to swallow when you're a researcher working on a project for eight years, you take it towards clinical trials and it fails. So it's statistically speaking, you've, you've got a 95% failure rate for drugs and it's even higher than that if you consider drugs targeting brain diseases. So we started to look at repurposed drugs because we can, so repurposed drugs are essentially drugs that are approved to treat other conditions. So think cancer, diabetes, uh, inflammatory diseases like arthritis, there's a lot of overlapping mechanisms that are found that are common to Parkinson's, especially if you think of inflammation. Inflammation is present in cancer, it's present in arthritis, it's, under, it's an underlying factor for diabetes. So a lot of, there are a lot of drugs out there. There are estimates from the work we've been doing with the pharma company on repurposing drugs using artificial intelligence is that there's about 8,000 drugs that have been into patients and proven to be safe, but they did not make their they didn't reach their target for the specific disease they were developed for, say arthritis or something else. 
And so they've been shelved after millions and sometimes billions of dollars invested in those research programs. And all of that's documented and there are databases where you have thousands and thousands of these research drugs, these drugs that have been in, in patients but not met their efficacy endpoints. So we focused on those, we, we're building programs around being able to find these drugs or, or what we call graveyard drugs that never made it towards clinical trials, but try and reposition them for Parkinson's by finding out the mechanisms that they target and if those mechanisms and pathways have relevance to Parkinson's. So we ended up with a couple uh, that have been of interest for Parkinson's in the field more broadly. Nilotinib is a cancer drug that the Michael J. Fox Foundation is funding and taking towards clinical trials. Exenatide was recently published out of out of groups in, in the UK, which is a diabetes drug that was one of the first ones to show effects in Parkinson's. And the work that we've been funded by Wesley to do is evaluate this drug called nilvadipine. So nilvadipine is an antihypertensive drug. It's extremely safe. It was used to treat hypertension in people in the 90s and early 2000s. It's still used in Europe in some places. So it's approved. It's been in patients. It's, it's extremely safe. So we've been testing this drug. We had some evidence in our mouse models and our animal work funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation where we've, we've given mice nilvadipine and it was shown to be neuroprotective in Parkinson's models. So uh, we came to the Wesley to fund this work to test nilvadipine in immune cells isolated from Parkinson's patients and healthy controls at clinics that we have at the Royal Brisbane. So in that work, what we're essentially doing in our projects right now are collecting blood samples from patients and healthy controls. So. We collect those at, we recruit from the Royal Brisbane and the UK Centre for Clinical Research. We isolate blood samples and we process that into plasma, into white blood cells. So that's the population, that's the component that has all of the immune cells. So from the white blood cell component of these patients, we isolate the immune cells and then we test our repurpose drugs. We stimulate the inflammasome using those protein aggregates that are found in Parkinson's brains. And then we test our repurpose drugs. So nilvadipines are key target, that key drug that we're looking at at the moment, and we then look at whether the drugs can work in, in human immune cells, which means they have a better chance of working in the brain as opposed to testing in a mouse, which we also do in some of our other projects. So what we found was this nilvadipine, the antihypertensive drug, can really is really effective at blocking inflammasome activation by these protein aggregates. So the synuclein aggregates, which are found in Parkinson's disease brains, if you treat, if you activate the inflammasome pathway using those, and you can see in the red bar there, you get really strong inflammasome activation in response to the aggregates. You treat the cells with nilvadipine in an animal range, which is really, really low. You can get pretty good, you know, pretty good reduction of that pathway. And we also found if you do that activation with other inflammasome activators, not necessarily just the ones with protein aggregates, you get, you can still shut down that pathway quite effectively using nilvadipine. So that led us to kind of, so this work is still ongoing, we're still about halfway, we've only recruited about 30 patients, so our goal is to recruit 40 and then do some biomarker studies and things like that. So what our, our results with that project were quite good, so we've progressed this towards clinical trials now and we've recently managed in partnership with Wesley set up what's called the Queensland Drug Repurposing Initiative. So we recently obtained funding from the state government. So we've got, this is about a $3.6 million program to take repurposed drugs for Parkinson's into clinical trials. So we've worked with the Cure Parkinson's Trust and their Link Clinical Trials Program. That's really the core of the scientific expertise comes from there. So the Cure Parkinson's Trust Link Clinical Trials Program they have an expert committee of about 20 leading researchers who meet once a year in either London or New York. And they work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and the Cure Parkinson's Trust to pick out about 16 to 20 of the most promising repurposed drugs for Parkinson's based on the, re the, most, the best available evidence. So they, what they, they do is the prioritization of the drugs. They pick out the most promising drugs from across all, all of the literature. And then they shortlist them and rank them. And then they try to find funding across the world to 
for these drugs to take them towards <laughs> clinical trials. And because they approve drugs for diabetes or any other diseases, they're already approved for treatment so they can go directly into clinical trials. So we've partnered with the Queensland government with funding from Wesley and with funding from UQ and our other partners, Griffith University and the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And we approached the state government for this funding through their Advanced Queensland Innovation Partnership Program to take two of the drugs that are prioritized by the Link Clinical Trials Program into clinical trials. So these trials are hoping, we are hoping they would commence. They're in the final stages of ethics approvals. So we're looking to commence them in the second half of 2019. We already started some we've got some inter a lot of interest in recruitment for these trials already so if you are interested if anyone is interested in getting involved in these trials or you know somebody who might be suitable our research nurse helen is somewhere in the audience so she'll be around afterwards she's right there and please get in touch and we're always looking for volunteers for all of our research for our blood studies in which we want to test our next batch and our next set of promising repurposed drugs and also, of course, for our clinical trials. And we're, of course, very grateful for our support. So that's the website for the Queensland Drug Repurposing Initiative that's just been set up. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Yeah.